Okay, hi everybody. I think we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, some people will continue to join. Well, I welcome everybody. So, uh, my name is Sarah DeFeo. I am the Vice President of Scientific Affairs and Programs here at Ovarian Cancer Research Fund Alliance. And I want to thank you all for joining us today as we continue our webinar series for 2018 with today's presentation on genetics. So just a little background about our organization. OCRFA is the largest global organization dedicated to fighting ovarian cancer. We advance research to prevent, treat, and defeat ovarian cancer. We support women and their families before, during, and beyond diagnosis. And we work with all levels of government to ensure ovarian cancer is a priority. So before we get started, just a few house, housekeeping notes to go through. So all of our listeners will be in a listen-only mode throughout the presentation. We will have some time for questions. Um, so if you think of a question as you're listening, you can type it into the Q&A box that you can see. I think it's on, the, on your right-hand side of your screen. Um, that's where it is for me, at least. Um, I'll see the questions and we'll select some um, to ask Kelly at the end of her presentation. Um, for those of you that submitted questions when you registered, uh, we have those questions as well, so thank you. You don't have to wait until the presentation is over to submit your questions. You can just type them in as we go along and as you think of it. Um, also, this webinar is being recorded um, and the, the audio and the slides will be available on the OCRFA website starting tomorrow. So if you miss something, no worries, you can go back and um, listen to us again. So a little about our presenter today, Kelly Morgan. Kelly Morgan is a board-certified genetic counselor at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center here in New York City, where she works with patients to provide information and resources, coordinate genetic testing, discuss risk, man risk management, and offer support. She's also involved uh, with clinical research focused on increasing the accessibility of genetic testing services. And you'll hear a little bit more um, detail tonight about some of the research that she's involved with. Kelly received her MS in genetic counseling from the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai after graduating with a bachelor's degree in genetics from the University of Wisconsin. Among her many prestigious internships and volunteer positions, Kelly founded the organization Chemo Companions, which pairs students with patients currently receiving cancer treatment. During her time at Mount Sinai, Kelly received the Jane Engelberg Memorial Fellowship Student Research Award and the Masters of Science in Genetic Counseling Program Award. So um, thank you, Kelly, for joining us tonight. Um, and I have passed the ball to you. And you can start your presentation whenever you're ready. Great. Thank you, Sarah, for the introduction, and thank you to OCRFA for hosting this ovarian cancer genetics talk this evening. I wanted to say a big thank you to everyone who is listening in. I do hope this evening I'm able to answer and address any of the questions or curiosities that are bringing you here. And really my goal is that by the end, anyone who would like to incorporate this information into your own medical care or for those of you who may want to use this information to serve as a resource for others, you have the knowledge to do so. So this evening we are going to be starting with an overview of what genetic counseling and what genetic testing is. We will then be focusing in on the role of genetic testing in ovarian cancer. We'll go through the benefits of genetic testing in addition to the barriers to genetic testing. I'll then be shifting gears and talking more about the B4 study. So this is one of the projects I'm involved with and it is a new initiative that hopes to address some of the barriers that we see in genetic testing. We will wrap up with next steps. So that will be next steps for anyone who may be eligible in the study and might be interested in participating. And also much more broadly, just next steps for anyone who might be interested in genetic counseling in general, how you would go about that. And then I'm happy to answer any questions that you all may have after that. So let's get started. What is genetic testing and genetic counseling? So this will start by sounding a little bit like high school biology, but if we think about it from the big picture, so every human has over 20,000 genes. We have two copies of every gene, and we get one from mom 
one from dad. Thinking about what genes do, so every gene contains a precise genetic code, this is called DNA, and this provides a set of instructions that our body can read and interpret, and this leads to all of the functions and traits that make us us. So when this DNA code has a change that prevents the instructions from being understood, we call this a mutation and there can be consequences. So certain genes protect us from developing cancer. When there is a mutation in one of these genes, individuals can be at an increased risk to develop certain cancers. So that is where cancer genetic testing comes into play. So genetic testing in this setting can identify mutations so that people can understand their risks and importantly, how to manage these risks and that is best done in consultation with a healthcare professional. So an example of one of those healthcare professionals would be a genetic counselor. So genetic counselors are trained to facilitate genetic testing by providing both information and support. In terms of the steps that would be required from start to finish, so the first is, of course, making an appointment. Um, some patients are referred by their physicians to genetic counseling, while others do initiate this process themselves, so this can certainly be through self-referral. So in preparation for a genetic counseling visit, it's important to compile all of the available family history information that you have in addition to any relevant medical records. At a genetic counseling visit, you'll review all of this information with your genetic counselor, and then based on that, you would discuss any genetic testing options that would be relevant and applicable to you. So if someone proceeds with genetic testing, it in and of itself is a simple blood test. Sometimes other samples like saliva can also be used. Ultimately, genetic testing does take some time, so it takes about one month for the results to come back, that's on average. Um, but once they are back, you do review all of this information with your genetic counselor, whether the results is positive or negative or something in between, what that means, and then what the next steps would be for both you and your family members. So focusing into the role of genetic testing in ovarian cancer, Generally speaking, if we look at all cancers together, about 10% of cancers are hereditary or due to a genetic mutation that can be inherited or passed on. So that means the remaining 90% are what we think of as sporadic or just arising by chance. When we look at ovarian cancer specifically, that rate is a little bit higher. So actually about a quarter of ovarian cancers are due to a genetic mutation. So you can see that ovarian cancers are somewhat more likely to be genetic in nature as opposed to some other cancers. Thinking about which genes are associated with ovarian cancer, so you can see the list up here of at least the genes we know about today. And what's really important to emphasize in this is that our knowledge is always evolving. So this looks, list looks different today than it did five years ago, and it very well could look different five years from now. So if a person has had genetic testing in the past, it is important to check in with your providers for updates, see if our understanding has changed and see if there is more to offer because we certainly are always learning. Today, genetic testing is recommended for anyone who has been diagnosed with ovarian cancer or their close relatives, that's if these family members are unavailable for testing. So these individuals would meet with a genetic counselor and have this individualized hereditary risk assessment. So this is going to include which genes should be included on a given genetic test. And outside of the scope of today, but I will just mention, anyone who has a personal or family history of other cancers should absolutely still speak with your provider, your genetic counselor, if you have any concerns and might want to consider genetic counseling. So I think it goes without saying that it can be incredibly difficult to think about sitting down to have a conversation about potential cancer risks. So I do want to emphasize the benefits of going through this process. We'll start by talking about prevention and risk management, and I think this is perhaps the most important part of the entire presentation. 
So understanding that to date there has unfortunately been no screening that has proven effective to reliably detect ovarian cancers from an early and treatable stage. So this means that unfortunately many ovarian cancers are diagnosed at a later and a more difficult to treat stage. So women who are at an increased risk to develop ovarian cancer are medically advised to have their ovaries and fallopian tubes removed. So this is a risk-reducing procedure before a cancer develops. It's laparoscopic, which means it's minimally invasive and usually a day procedure, and it can be truly life-saving. Depending on the gene that is identified, individuals who test positive may also be at a risk for other cancers, which could be either also prevented or in some cases screening is also an option. And so ultimately, if and when an ovarian surgery is recommended, it's very dependent on someone's family history and the genetic testing results. The other area where this information is becoming increasingly important is in the world of targeted treatment, which I think is a very exciting area. So as an example, PARP inhibitors are a class of drug that are now approved as a potential therapy option for women who are BRCA positive with ovarian cancer. They are also approved in other BRCA positive individuals with different cancer diagnoses, but important to understand that this isn't an option that is used for everyone or right for everyone, but it certainly is good to have as something that could be used. Now, I would like to focus on the BRCA1 and BRCA2 genes. So these genes are the most common hereditary cause of ovarian cancer. So around 15% of ovarian cancers are due to mutations in the BRCA genes. So this does mean that there are the remaining 5 to 10% of ovarian cancers that are hereditary and are due to mutations in other genes. So thinking about that list we had up on the previous slide, so while we are focusing on BRCA today, these other genes are equally important in someone's hereditary cancer risk assessment and absolutely would be considered in a genetic counseling, genetic testing setting. So starting with a couple of numbers for BRCA. So anyone could have a BRCA mutation. The frequency is about one in every 400 individuals. And I would like to point out that in individuals of Ashkenazi Jewish ancestry, that frequency is increased by about tenfold. So one in every 40 individuals of Ashkenazi Jewish ancestry actually carries a BRCA mutation. One important distinction to point out is that in the general population, the mutation in a family could be one of hundreds of possible mutations, so anywhere throughout these genes. Whereas in the Ashkenazi Jewish population, there are specifically three mutations. You can think of them as hotspots that make up over 90% of the possible mutations that someone who's Ashkenazi Jewish would carry. And so these encompass a lot of, but not all of, someone's hereditary risk if they're Ashkenazi. So often, if someone is Ashkenazi Jewish, the first line test is to look at those three spots in the genes. And if that is negative, depending on personal or family history, sometimes more testing is offered. And so I point that out in particular because we will circle back to it later on in the presentation. So now to walk through BRCA as an example of cancer risks and medical management, starting with ovarian cancer. So we know that in the general population, ovarian cancer is quite rare. There's about a 1.5% risk um, of over your lifetime, and we know that in the setting of BRCA, that risk is greatly increased to up to about 40 to 60%. So because of this risk, it is recommended that women have their ovaries and fallopian tubes removed after childbearing is complete. And I'm often asked, what is the difference between BRCA1 and BRCA2? So an important distinction, one way in which they are different than one another is that for BRCA1, the ovarian cancer risks are a little bit earlier and a little bit higher. So that surgical recommendation is between the ages of around 35 to 40. Whereas for BRCA2, the cancer risks are a little bit lower and later. So that recommendation for removing the ovaries and fallopian tubes is between 40 and 45. And of course, an important factor in all of this is family planning. So a genetic counselor can absolutely work with you to make sure you are able to achieve those goals in the context of this important 
risk-reducing procedure. Thinking about other associations, so in addition to being the most common hereditary cause of ovarian cancer, the BRCA genes are actually also the most common hereditary cause of breast cancer. So we know that women who have BRCA mutations have up to about an 80% lifetime risk of breast cancer. So it certainly is greatly elevated over the general population. Men also have a slightly increased risk to develop breast cancer. Unlike ovarian cancer, it's a slightly different story when we talk about breast cancer risk, and that is because we do have screening that has proven very effective to pick up cancers at usually what is a fairly early and treatable stage. So someone who has a BRCA mutation to manage their breast cancer risk has options. So option one is to do breast screening, which is from the age of 25 MRIs once a year and then adding in mammograms at the age of 30. The other option is to have a risk-reducing surgery, so removing the breasts or a mastectomy. And so it is very much so a personal choice, and I just want to emphasize that choice because of the efficacy of screening in this setting. Thinking about other cancer risks, so in addition to there being a small male breast cancer risk, there is also a significantly increased risk of prostate cancer for men who carry BRCA mutations. So it is important for men to know their BRCA status. It informs the age at which they're recommended to start prostate screening. We also know that prostate cancers can be more aggressive with BRCA mutations, so it is important from a treatment perspective as well. Lastly, there is a fairly small association between pancreatic cancer and BRCA mutations. I will say that we are still learning about what factors may predispose one family as compared to another to develop pancreatic cancer, and research is also ongoing to better understand how we can potentially screen for this small risk. So we've talked about BRCA and know that we very well could have this same discussion for all of these ovarian cancer genes on our list. So in the spirit of keeping things moving, we are going to um, move on to the barriers so that I can make sure to answer any questions you all have in the end. And so now my question here is, wondering if everyone with a personal or family history of ovarian cancer is offered genetic testing. We know that it is medically indicated and can be potentially life-saving. Unfortunately, the answer is no. So the minority of women and families with a personal or family history of ovarian cancer actually go through with genetic testing. And so I want to explore that a little bit further. So. Next, we are going to talk through the different barriers that can come up when we think about genetic testing for patients and family members. We'll walk through this sort of potential process from start to finish, but I'll first just say genetic testing does not have to start with someone who has had an ovarian cancer diagnosis, but it is most informative to start with this person if they're available. If they are not, absolutely, family members should still go in and be tested. So thinking about this flow from start to finish, someone has had an ovarian cancer diagnosis and is undergoing treatment, the first step has to be that initial referral, so getting these patients in to see a genetic counselor. This person could choose to move forward with their own genetic testing. If a genetic mutation is identified, it's important to then communicate this information to the family. And then these family members, once they're told about the risk, can go in for their own genetic counseling visits and then could choose to move forward with genetic testing. So as you can see, that's a lot of different steps. So there are a lot of potential barriers that can come up in all of this, and some of you may find yourself at different points along this path. So I think it is important to bring awareness to some of these barriers so that they can be both addressed and overcome. Starting with that initial referral, so how often are women with ovarian cancer actually referred to genetic counseling? Only about 10 to 30 percent of women who have been diagnosed with an ovarian cancer are referred. So this is by far the most common reason for lack of genetic testing. 
some of the different reasons why. So thinking about genetics, it is a very um, specialty or niche area in medicine. So if someone doesn't have sufficient training in genetics, if they aren't either, you know, a genetic counselor or another healthcare provider who has opted for that additional training, many physicians, including most of our primary care physicians, would rate their knowledge of genetics and genetic testing as poor, feeling that they need more training. So that can make it difficult for a a physician to know what questions to ask about the family to assess risk, difficult to know when to refer to genetic counseling. And then on top of that, another layer is that even for physicians who may be more aware um, from a genetics perspective, many physicians don't know how to actually refer to a genetic counselor or aren't in contact with these providers to facilitate genetic counseling and genetic testing for their patients. So thinking about some potential solutions, so genetic counselors and other genetics providers can absolutely develop tools as resources for other healthcare professionals to increase knowledge, understanding, and awareness of genetic testing services. I will also say that as a patient, you can absolutely take this information into your own hands to self-refer yourself to genetic counseling once you're aware of the potential risks in your family. So thinking about if someone has gone through with genetic testing and a genetic mutation is identified, how does this play out in the family? So we know that and we're encouraged to see that genetic testing results are discussed in about 75% of families. So that rate is fairly high. We would love for it to be 100%. But one of the biggest limitations is that communication is highest with first degree relatives. So it's easiest to reach your siblings, your children, your parents. And it's more difficult sometimes to have access to more extended relatives, your aunts, uncles, cousins, grandparents, but these relatives are also at a significantly increased risk because of the mutation in their family, and it's important that we find ways to share this information with them. Some of the reasons for this failure in communication, so first addressing that there is, of course, a stigma surrounding cancer and there can be a fear of causing distress. So if you've just learned about your own cancer risks, it can feel overwhelming to think about how you may have that conversation with family members. So then another layer is thinking about family dynamics. If family dynamics are are more challenging if cancer diagnoses is not something that is discussed in the family. And then there's simply lack of contact. So maybe you haven't seen your cousin since that family reunion 15 years ago. It's hard for you to think about how you, you know, might be able to reach them. So genetic counselors can absolutely play a role here. So we can work with people to assist in this familial communication. So addressing the stigmas, any fears, thinking about how we can um, confront more challenging family dynamics, and then also getting creative. So things like lack of contact, how can we, you know, think about reaching those distant cousins? Can we send a letter in the mail? And how can we reach as many people as we can so that people are aware of this potentially life-saving information? So imagining that someone has been informed that there is a genetic mutation in their family, how often are people to then proceed with genetic counseling. So only about one-third to two-thirds percent, two-thirds of individuals actually proceed with genetic counseling even when there's a known mutation in the family. So this is the second largest factor in lack of genetic testing. So the reasons why I think can be broadly divided into logistical and psychological. So logistically speaking, access to genetic counselors, unfortunately there are only about 4,500 genetic counselors as opposed to over 300,000 primary care physicians just for scale. Um, what that can lead to is barriers such as travel distance. So perhaps the closest genetic counselor to you is a, an hour drive away or the wait time to get into a clinic may be several weeks to several months. So those are some of the logistical barriers. And so now thinking about the psychological barriers. So thinking about how it could feel distressing to prepare to and to sit down to have a conversation about potential risk. And I think that the logistical barriers can make the psychological barriers even 
worse. So if someone is having reservations about going in and then they find out that the clinic is an hour away and a two-month wait time, that's going to make you less likely to go in or it's easier to find an out. So I think that researchers should absolutely explore new models of genetic testing that can increase the accessibility and convenience and really address the logistical barriers head on so that we can have more time and the availability to discuss these psychological barriers in more detail with, with patients once they're into genetic counseling. And then when we look at, so how likely is someone to proceed with genetic counseling or genetic testing after a genetic counseling visit. So that rate is pretty high. It's up to about 90% of individuals. So the reason why we think genetic testing rates are so high, a couple of different reasons. One is thinking about how the education surrounding the actionability of genetic testing can be very empowering to learn about. It's not just these cancer risks we're telling you about, but it's absolutely the medical management that goes along with it. Secondly, some common misconceptions can be clarified during genetic counseling visits. So just to think of a few, so one that we addressed a little bit earlier on, so for breast cancer risk management, some people may think that a breast surgery or removing the breasts is the only option for breast risk, but we know that screening is just as medically viable an option and it's very much so a personal choice, so introducing choice in that setting. Um, another misconception is that dad's side of the family doesn't matter for these female cancer risks or predominantly female cancer risks. That is certainly not the case because we know that genetic risk is equally likely to come from dad as it is from mom. Ultimately, so once someone understands all of the different options and the risks and benefits of these options, people are fairly likely to move forward with their own genetic testing. So now looking back at this start to finish flow of patients and their family members receiving genetic testing, you can see that there could be roadblocks really anywhere along the way, but broadly speaking, the most significant barrier is getting people who are at risk to a genetic counselor. So I think that we absolutely need to make genetic counseling more accessible, and the good news is, is that there is lots of work underway to do that. So as one example, the B4 study, this is a project I joined about a year ago and it was in the works long before that. So the B4 study that stands for the BRCA Founder Outreach Study. So the goal of this study is to evaluate an innovative model that increases access to genetic testing to ultimately provide more people with potentially life-saving information. And we'll explain a lot more about that new model thinking about who is eligible for this study. So it's important to emphasize that this study offers testing for those Ashkenazi Jewish founder mutations in the BRCA genes. So if you are not Ashkenazi Jewish, this study in and of itself would not be an informative test for you. So the study started on March 5th, and as of now, we have a little over 1,000 people fully enrolled in the study. The goal is to enroll 4,000 individuals, and the study is open across the metropolitan areas of New York, Boston, Philadelphia, and Los Angeles. So this study is very targeted and specific, but the model that we are testing can be adapted potentially very broadly. So thinking about some potential future iterations on the study or ways that this could be used in many more uh, settings that are applicable to a larger group of people. So one, the study could be expanded geographically, so the same test could be offered on a national basis, for example. And then this, this model could be adapted in terms of the information in the platform and then the genetic test itself, so it could be modified for different populations in addition to more broadly for more genes and more hereditary cancer predisposition. So it is exciting to think about how this study is being implemented and how it has, I think, a lot of future promise for more, more utility and more accessibility. This study is being led by truly the experts in the field of cancer genetics. So you can see our leaders in our four sites here, their pictures and their names as well, in New York, Boston, Philadelphia, and Los Angeles. So who is eligible to participate in B4? You do have to be 25 or older. You have to have at least one grandparent of Ashkenazi Jewish ancestry. You have to reside within the eligible zip codes of New York, Boston, Philadelphia, and Los Angeles. And you do have to have health insurance. 
So the BRCA testing itself is completely free of charge. It does not go through your insurance. But the reason why health insurance is important is thinking about follow-up. So depending on your test result, there can be important medical follow-up that then does go through health insurance. B4 as a study is funded by a private philanthropy. So now thinking about the various steps to participate, it's five easy steps. The first step is registering. So as opposed to scheduling an appointment and waiting to go in to see a genetic counselor, you are doing this entire process from home. So you just log on to b4study.com. This could be on your home computer or even your smartphone. You confirm your eligibility to participate, and then you could go on to complete this online interactive uh, pre-test tutorial, so you would get all of the same information as a genetic counseling visit prior to testing, but it's in the form of videos, question and answer, and a chat back and forth. You also answer some personal and family history questionnaires to make sure your individual risk is factored into your recommendations after the test. So if you were interested in proceeding with BRCA testing after going through this online platform, you would give your consent. And then keeping in the theme of convenience, this is done at local Quest laboratories. That's where you would provide your blood samples. So the study can inform you what's your closest Quest location based on your zip code. And you all probably even know where the closest Quest to you would be. We know that they're, they're all over the place. And so now getting your results. This is another very unique part of the study, an important point to emphasize. So you are initiating this process from home, but you are not doing it alone. And ultimately, this all stays in the context of a medical setting. So you can choose to receive your results from either a study genetic counselor or your own physician. So thinking about choosing your own physician, this is someone who knows you well and is very familiar with your care. For some, that feels more convenient, whereas for others, they would prefer to see a genetic counselor. If someone chooses their own physician to provide the results and recommendations to them, we as the study team will reach out to the physician and provide all of the educational materials they would need to feel equipped to disclose the results. And if they feel they're up for it, physicians could join the study and disclose your genetic testing results to you. Thinking about follow-up, so keeping this all in a medical context, your interpretation of the results is provided by the study genetic counselors or the physicians. Whether your test result is positive and you need to be plugged into some follow-up care, that is something that the study will guide you towards. Or even for those who have a negative test result, but say you have a strong family history, then we may say that there's further genetic testing that could be informative to you. So thinking about how B4 addresses barriers, so I like to think of this through the three E's, expand, enable, empower. So first, expand. So we are expanding genetic, counsel, genetic testing beyond genetic counselors. So we're engaging primary care physicians and other healthcare providers. So this involvement can absolutely increase awareness. You can imagine how a physician participating in the study would in the future know when and how to refer patients to genetic counseling or feel comfortable offering genetic testing. So engaging many more healthcare providers in this process to expand access. And then enable, we want to take away the logistical barriers and make it easier and more convenient to move forward with genetic counseling and genetic testing. And lastly, empower. So it is not the information seeing cancer risks on a piece of paper that is informative to you, that's beneficial to you. It's the medical interpretation. So it's critical that we keep this convenience in the medical context. So making sure that you are getting all of the recommendations and the follow-up care that you should so that ultimately you could make a potentially life-saving decision by doing genetic testing in a medical context. So then lastly, thinking about next steps. So first, I wanted to show everyone on the, on the call today what this online portal actually looks like. So you can see here, it starts with a simple hello, and then it more or less looks like texting back and forth. Receiving information, this is all pre-programmed, and you can imagine this is something you can do at a time that's convenient for you after you've put your kids to bed in the evening or on the weekends when you have some free time. 
And so, if you might be eligible and interested in participating in the B4 study as a way to have testing for those common Jewish mutations in the BRCA genes, I would absolutely encourage you to visit b4study.com for more information and to enroll if you're interested. More broadly speaking, the take-home message is that anyone with a personal or family history of ovarian cancer, even those who have had genetic testing in the past but may be eligible for updates, should absolutely talk to your health healthcare provider or you yourself can visit findageneticcounselor.com. I think this is a great tool that can make genetic counseling an even easier process to navigate. So, for example, this website will provide information on what all is involved and required, and it even has a zip code locator. So you can type in your zip code and find what genetic counselors would be in your area or closest to you. So with that, I would like to say thank you for listening, and I would be happy now to answer any questions that you all may have. Great. Kelly, thank you very much. Um, great presentation. So we do have some time for questions, and we've had a bunch that are coming in. Um, again, you all can just type them into the Q&A box uh, there at the bottom of your screen. So to get us started, Kelly, we have had a few questions come in and I, um, that are all kind of alluding to the same issue. Um, and I'm wondering if you can kind of, you alluded to sort of how the landscape of genetic testing is changing over time, right? That the, the list of mutations that um, we had associated with ovarian cancer 10 years ago is not, is not what it was five years ago and is not what it is today. So given that it's changing, how do you recommend people navigate that? So I guess there could be different questions, right? If you had, um, you know, a test uh, 10 years ago, for um, but it was only limited to the BRCA uh, genes, what would you recommend somebody do? Um, if someone is tested today, how do you recommend, what would you recommend they do five years from now? Um, how do you, I guess this is sort of a general question, but how do you recommend people proceed given the fact that this landscape is changing so rapidly and that there are people who have been tested who are now wondering, well, you know, do I need to be tested again? Absolutely, that is a great question. And so it is certainly, it, it can be confusing. It's tricky to navigate because things are always evolving. So thinking about how to stay the most up to date in a way that's going to be doable and accessible. So one would be if you have had genetic testing through a genetic counseling center, you can absolutely call their main line at any point and whether or not your genetic counselor is still there, your record will be there. So you can say, I had genetic testing in 2010 or a couple of years ago if you don't quite remember. Is there any updated testing that I should consider? And then they can absolutely look into your file and say, well, it was 2012 and you only had BRCA. Absolutely, you can come back for an update. You'll sit back down with a genetic counselor. Say you did not initially go through the route of a genetic counselor. You can still reach out to any genetic counselor through, say, findageneticcounselor.com, look up your zip code and call someone who's in a, you know, close distance from you and say, here's my genetic testing results. I don't know what this means, but is this sufficient? So any provider, genetic counselor, or physician who is well-versed in genetics can be your resource. And I would say prospectively, after genetic testing, you can absolutely call, call the center every, every couple of years to see if there's any updates. Okay. Great. Got it. Um, and again, you've sort of, oh, some of what you said has um, kind of touched on this or hinted at this, but I'm, I'm wondering if you can just talk more explicitly about these um, gene panel tests, because some, you know, some folks may have been tested for just BRCA1 and 2 mutations, but these days um, there are these multi-panel multi tests. So can you just kind of talk about what those are and how those are useful? Absolutely. So from a historical perspective, prior to about 2008, the only test that we had was something called, or for 
BRCA specifically, was BRCA sequencing. After that year, we added on something called BRCA rearrangement, so today we're able to do full testing for the BRCA genes. But it wasn't until about 2013 when multi-gene panels started to be introduced, and it took a couple of years for centers to adopt these tests but what multi-gene panels are is, just as they sound, someone can be tested for multiple genes. So there are two types of panels. There are multi-gene panels that are specifically to one cancer type or family history. So if someone has a personal and family history of ovarian cancer, there are ovarian gene panels, and that would be a curation of all of the ovarian cancer risk genes. Someone could have a family history of breast and ovarian cancer, and then you would be offered a breast ovarian panel. And then there are pan cancer panels, which are available at some centers, so instead of targeting panel tests and the genes to the personal or family history, sometimes more broad panels that encompass hereditary cancer risk as a whole are also being used. I will say that is not as routine, and so the way it's typically done in genetic counseling is by looking at a family history, assessing basically pulling all of those cancers out, and the ones that are hereditary get added into that panel test. So it can be very customized and very individualized to broadly assess hereditary risk. Got it. Good. Thank you. <clears throat> okay. Um, could you talk um, a little bit about the implications of BRCA mutations in men? We have a question Absolutely. about Yep. So for men, the biggest risk is prostate cancer. So men with BRCA mutations do have an increased risk of prostate cancer, and we know that it can be more aggressive prostate cancer. So it's important that men have PSAs and um, exams from the age of 40, so that's earlier than the general population. And Another reason why this is important in all of this is that sometimes physicians may have a lower threshold of how elevated a PSA is and when they choose to do a biopsy given that these cancers can be more aggressive. So that's the big risk. And then there is also that small risk of male breast cancer. So it's up to about 2 to 7% for BR, or BRCA2 and a little bit lower for BRCA1. Some men, particularly with BRCA2 mutations, do opt to get mammograms. That depends on, for example, if there is any tissue to go through the mammogram. Um, but certainly breast awareness is important for men with BRCA mutations. And then the other small risk for both women and men, as it applies, would be a small risk of pancreatic cancer, but we currently do not have a screening for that cancer. Okay. Good. Thank you. Um, related question um, about men. Uh, someone asked, please discuss the probability of getting the BRCA gene mutation through the father. So I think people are still, yeah, I think people could use some additional help understanding how these mutations can come from either of their parents. Absolutely. That's a great question. And it's so important to understand how this can be passed down in a family. So. We'll think of it this way. So for all of our genes, we have two copies. We get one from mom, one from dad. So let's use BRCA1 as an example. Mom has two copies of the BRCA1 gene. Dad has two copies of the BRCA1 gene. So we all have these genes, whether we're female or male, and any of us can carry a genetic mutation. So if someone has, say, dad, has one of his copies of BRCA1 carrying a genetic mutation, the other copy is working fine. Mom's, both copies are working fine. Mom is going to pass down a, a working copy, both of hers work fine, and dad, there's a 50-50 risk for each of his children that he either passes on the copy with no mutation, so without the associated cancer risks, or on the flip side, the other flip of the coin is that he passes down the copy with the genetic mutation, and those children would have the corresponding cancer risks, these adult cancer risks. So it doesn't matter if it's mom or dad. If one parent carries a genetic mutation, there's a 50-50 risk that the children do or don't inherit that same genetic mutation. Okay. Good. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, okay, some other questions. Um, is it useful to have genetic testing, BRCA or otherwise, 
for the child of a parent who had ovarian cancer in the absence of any other family history of ovarian or breast cancer? Good question. So first to say that for BRCA and these other adult onset cancer genes, we do not advise children proceed with genetic testing because there are no childhood cancer risks broadly speaking, and so for BRCA, around the age of 18, when someone's an adult, they could choose to move forward with genetic testing. Often, I'll say, women may choose to test around 25, because that's the age that medical management changes. Um, but to address the second point, even if there's just one person, so someone has a mother with ovarian cancer and that's the only family history, if she has not had genetic testing or she has not had complete genetic testing, then genetic counseling would absolutely be warranted and someone can move forward with genetic testing. Okay. Um, <clears throat> let's see. So thinking about family members of folks who have ovarian cancer, um, how, well, what someone has asked is, how does a family member of an ovarian cancer patient who has the BRCA1 mutated, mutation um, receive genetic testing? How do they go about getting their insurance to cover the cost of testing? Can you comment a little bit about how that usually plays out if, if a person feels they have a family history but they themselves do not have cancer? Mm -hmm. And so when we think about ovarian cancer, unlike other cancers where we need particular patterns in a family and ages of diagnoses, usually one close relative with ovarian cancer is enough to be recognized by almost all insurance companies for coverage. I'll also say that genetic counseling and genetic testing are two different expenses. So genetic counseling is, is almost always covered as long as it's a center that takes your insurance. And then genetic testing is something that if you have a close relative with ovarian cancer, or you yourself have had ovarian cancer, it is covered by your insurance in most all cases. Um, the only caveat is that for individuals who have Medicare, they do not cover testing in most cases in someone who has not had their own diagnosis. Um, so that can be something to consider, but absolutely still going to see a genetic counselor because we have many different ways to factor in insurance to the discussion and figure out what the best plan for you will be. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, we have a question, what do you see as the health insurance risk to getting tested? Um, I'm not positive what this person is asking, but I think I have a sense of where they may be going with it. <laughs> mm -hmm. So this is where I will bring up something called GINA or the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act. So this is a law that has been put into place to protect any possible genetic discrimination from health insurance or employers. So it is illegal, for example, for health insurance to use your genetic status in any way. There are some smaller caveats and loopholes, so it's important to review this with a genetic counselor, but that's really how this, how this works is that there are protections in place. Um, however, there are not the same protections in place for life insurance, long-term care disability, so those types of insurances. So sometimes people do choose to get policies into place Place prior to genetic testing if they feel particularly concerned about the potential for that information to be used in that setting. Um, but it's very hard to say whether or not that information is used in things like life insurance when they're requesting your records from you when you're applying for a policy. But it is a consideration worth addressing um, in a genetic counseling session to make sure you have any concerns addressed. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, so this is, there's no easy answer to this question, <laughs> but I'm going to ask it anyway, um, just because you may have dealt with it with some of your, um, mm -hmm. some of the folks that you've helped. Uh, someone is asking, what can you do for family members who just won't get tested even when they are BRCA mutations present? Mm -hmm. so how do you, how do you advise people when they're up against, you know, someone who doesn't want to be tested? It's really hard. I think that it is something that certainly happens in families for various reasons. The biggest thing that I recommend and, and suggest is don't feel like you have to 
convey all of the associated cancer risks to them and be their genetic counselor. Let us be their genetic counselor. So if there's anything you can do to get them in, maybe we'll go to lunch and then see a genetic counselor. You don't have to do anything. Just go in and, and see him or her and hear what they have to say, hear them out, and then I won't bug you about it again. So sometimes, sometimes bargaining or thinking about, you know, let us have that conversation with someone and address, you know, what, what those barriers are. Um, mm -hmm. And just, you know, we, we do all that we can to get people to see a genetic counselor and consider moving forward. Um, so I think you just try your best and do and we know that not everyone gets genetic genetic testing or goes in to see a genetic counselor. Right. But we certainly try. Right, right. Um, <clears throat> here's an excellent question. Um, can you comment on um, genetic testing results that come back as sort of inconclusive or this nebulous, you know, variant of unknown <laughs> significance mm -hmm. that may show up on some of these um, reports? And what are we to make of them, and what do you recommend people do if they have one that comes back on their um, genetic testing report? Great question. I'm, I'm glad this was asked so that I can address yeah. it. So whenever genetic testing is done, where we're sequencing through multiple genes, there is the possibility of three types of results, which sounds kind of counterintuitive, but a positive result could come back, meaning we found a mutation in a gene that's associated with particular cancer risks. It could be negative, meaning that we ruled out any genetic mutations associated with cancer risks, or this in-between, this thing that we call a variant of unknown significance. So. Variants of unknown significance represent changes in the genes that cannot be interpreted by the laboratory because they just don't yet have enough data to make a conclusive decision on whether it damages the function of the gene and causes cancer risks or whether it's a totally benign variation. So it's always a tricky interpretation because all of our genes look different from one another. When someone has a variant of uncertain significance, the most important thing is that in most all cases, after a sit-down conversation with a genetic counselor, variants of uncertain significance are often treated innocent until proven guilty. So over 90% of the time, variants of unknown significance are downgraded to meaning nothing or being benign changes. They're just unfamiliar. However, about 10% of the time, they are actually upgraded ultimately and do have real cancer risks. So it is really important to keep in touch with a genetic counselor in the future. You can call and check in, say, once a year to see if there's been any, up, been any updates on the status of your variant. But in most all cases, people do not make medical decisions and would not have any surgeries or anything changing in their medical care with these variants because they're most of the time benign and we don't have enough evidence to say anything should be done differently. So they're tricky, but we keep in contact with you to help you navigate this sort of uncertainty or in-between. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so just, we'll probably just do a few more questions here. It's our hour's almost up. Um, somebody wrote in with a question. Um, uh, there's a history of ovarian cancer in the family, um, a mother with ovarian cancer, um, yet she, I think two members of the family had ovarian cancer, and yet her mother was BRCA negative. So if you have a family history, but one person is tested no, um, at least for the BRCA gene, would you, in that, obviously the specific is hard to know, but um, would you, what sort of conversation takes place then with a genetic counselor in that sort of situation? Um, mm -hmm. I guess it's a right. <laughs> so if if all if say so say a family member, say if all of the affected family members have had complete genetic testing and we haven't been able to turn up any genetic association with the cancer. So we do know that first-degree relatives of someone diagnosed with ovarian cancer have about double the general population risk to develop ovarian cancer. So as opposed to the 1.5% risk, that risk is somewhere around 3%. So what we do is we provide an interpretation of risk and recommendations based on family history, taking into account all of the diagnoses and the genetic testing that has taken place in the family, and it is a very individualized discussion at that point. Okay, great, thank you. 
Okay, maybe two more questions. Um, uh, someone asked a question which I think is ultimately getting at what is the difference between genetic testing and having your tumor, if you have cancer, tested? Mm -hmm. Great question. So the genetic testing that we're talking about is taking a blood sample to look at all of the genetic changes that you could have been born with. So that would have been potentially inherited and then you have a risk of passing on. So they would be gene mutations found in all of the cells of your body. So tumor testing is something that is relevant and applicable primarily to to treatment and understanding the tumor in and of itself. It sometimes does give us clues about potential inherited risk, but really the difference is that in tumor testing, we're looking at the tumor specifically to see how the tumor arose and what changes were specific and acquired. Whereas for genetic testing of the blood, we're looking at more broadly all of the changes you could have been born with. And sometimes those two pieces of information can be used together. Got it. Great. That was very clear. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> okay, last question I think we'll take. Um, this is actually about the B4 study you were discussing. Um, this person says, you know, is just sort of asking, there are sizable populations of Ashkenazi Jews in other parts of the country. Say, for example, um, Detroit area, um, Miami, Florida area. Uh, in terms of this, in your specific trial, is there are there plans to expand the geographic areas um, of the trial, or are you just sticking with those cities for now? Yes, that is the hope. So I would say to stay tuned. So our website is going to have those kind of updates. After the study is full, we want to um, continue collecting the information of those who may be interested. So that includes, you know, where you live, because we would love to expand this test more broadly and make it something that was beyond these geographical regions in the future. Okay, great. So everybody can stay tuned. Um, okay, our hour is just about up, so I think we will end it there. Um, thank you again, Kelly, um, for a great presentation, and thank you everyone who called in today and for all of your excellent questions. Um, please take a minute to fill out the survey that uh, will appear on your screen um, at the end of this event. Your feedback is very important to us. It helps us put together topics for future webinars. Our next webinar will be next month, uh, June 19th, on immuno-oncology. So uh, keep your eyes peeled for an email from OCRFA on that. And again, this webinar is being recorded, so you can go back and listen to the audio and see the slides again. They'll be posted on our website tomorrow. Uh, for more information about OCRFA, you can always visit our website at www.ocrfa.org. So thank you, everyone, and have a great evening.